We hope you enjoy listening to this weekly podcast from Lifeline Church. Find out more by visiting lifelinechurch.co.uk. Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see your faces. So many of you. I thought everyone would be off on holiday already, but you're still holding back. Um, that is cool. Okay, let's just see if this works. That's it. Does. Cool. So, today we're going to be talking about the pursuit of holiness. It can sound like quite a big topic. It is a big topic. I'm not necessarily going to say that we're going to cover all of holiness today, but I just want to kind of talk to you about it as something that's been live with me. So, why are we talking about this topic? So, the first thing is, I kind of want to help us untangle a wrong notion that we might have about holiness. When we think about holiness, sometimes you might hear the phrase, oh, she's a bit holier than thou. It's quite a derogatory term. It's just something that we use as a bit of a religious statement. And because of that, I think that the power of what holiness means and the word itself has become lost. So what I'd like to do today is hopefully try and untangle some of that and try and unpick some of that for us. I also kind of want to talk about this topic because it's something that is completely real and live with me. Um, For me, this whole topic started as a result of the issue with addiction. And during that time and throughout this process, I've been learning some stuff. And what I'd love to do is share some of that stuff with you today, some of the learnings along that journey. But one thing that I want to assure you is that this message is most assuredly not a try harder message. This isn't about do better or try harder. So, with that in mind, as we start today, I want you to think about two things. We're going to come back to this at the end, so this is a bit of a memory game. I want you to remember an invitation and a story. That's the two things that I want you to remember. We'll come back to them at the end. The first thing is an invitation. I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy, because I am holy. I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. And then in Peter, in the New Testament, it says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, be holy in all you do. For it is written... Be holy, because I am holy. So those two scriptures, one in the Old Testament, when God was setting the foundations for how people should live, his chosen people, the Israelites, he asked them, he told them, be holy as I am holy. And we could consider that in the New Testament, because of the cross, that may not necessarily be the case. But here we've got evidence that Peter is saying, after the cross, after what Jesus has done, the instruction is still there. Be holy as I am holy. So that's the invitation. And the other thing that I want you to remember is the story. So there is a story of Isaiah who was a prophet to the Israelites um, in the Old Testament. He had a vision of going to heaven. He saw strange creatures called seraphim flying around singing, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Kind of a glimpse of what we we sung about this morning, about his holiness. That is what's happening in heaven all the time. And there was these strange creatures there. And Isaiah knows that he shouldn't be in that place. He knows very well the laws given to him um, by God, the laws given to his people know he shouldn't be in that pl- place without being consumed. Because he, is, he says, I am a man of unclean lips, it says. He knows that he is sin. He knows that he has fallen short. And he knows that he should be destroyed. But what actually happens is that one of the seraphim, one of those strange angelic creatures, takes a coal, a hot coal, from the altar in heaven and touches Isaiah's lips. And he becomes pure. It says, your sin is taken away. So I want you to remember that, the invitation and the story. And we're going to come back to those things in a second. But first of all, I kind of want to define what holiness is. And this may sound like a cop-out, but holiness is who he is. That's a simple definition. He is holy. And we sung about it this morning. We've sung so much about his holiness, about his purity, about his goodness. And the best analogy that I can think of when talking about his holiness is the sun. 
the sun in our solar system is a source of life. It's a source of, it creates things. Because of the heat of the sun, it is able to provide the perfect conditions for life to occur on our planet. We're in what they call the Goldilocks zone. Um, if we were too far away or too close, we'd be consumed or be too cold. But we're right in the right place. Um, so it's a source of all that's good and gives life. Ultimately, it describes his power. It describes that is utter, utter, utter goodness. Um, and so when the Israelites were going into the Holy of Holies, this place where God's presence dwelt, sometimes they were consumed, sometimes they died. And that doesn't mean that God's presence is bad or evil. It just means it's utterly good. It's so good that it, we can't stand to be in it if we are not the same. So that is the definition of holiness. So therefore, in that place, stuff like bad things, sin, really can't exist in such a place where there's holiness. So that's a kind of a definition of what holiness is. It's not necessarily doing well, as we'll look on a bit later. It's about recognizing the power and the wholeness and the fullness and the purity that God is. So the question is, if God is saying, be holy as I am holy... Why? Why should we pursue that? And I think the first thing is love of the Father. We do it because he's asked, of it, asked it of us. We pursue holiness because he has asked us to do it. And because we love him, we want to obey him. It's pretty as simple as that, really. But also, I think there's another thing. And it's something that I think, what, if you have heard this message about holiness before, you can start to think that it's a very self-absorbed, do better, achieve a perfect scorecard, be holy. I think that falls short of what holiness is. In Ezekiel, who was another prophet in the Old Testament, he had a vision of going up into heaven and seeing a temple, a heavenly kingdom. And from that heavenly kingdom flowed a river. And wherever that river touched, wherever the water of that river came, there was life, there was goodness, there were things being created. And again, in Revelation, John's revelation, um, when he has a vision of heaven, he sees this new kingdom, this new heaven, this new earth, and from, from that new kingdom flows this river, Ezekiel's river. I really, really believe that the pursuit of holiness is to pursue, not to obtain perfect behavior or brownie points. It's to work, work towards being the people that are set apart, that are different, that can bring life, that can bring goodness, that can bring wholeness to a dying world. That's really why I believe God is asking holiness of us. It's because we can bring his kingdom here on earth. So, if that's why we pursue holiness, I want to really just address something here right now at the outset. Holiness is not about achieving perfect behavior. It's not about being morally good. There are plenty and plenty of morally good people in the world. But do they carry the life of the spirit? Do they carry a life that will bring wholeness and goodness to this dying world? I don't think so. I think... What holiness is, is accepting the identity that he has placed on you, to recognize everything that he has done. So in this uh, worship that we did this morning, all of the songs were about what he has done. All of the songs have been about, because the sinless savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. It's nothing to do with what I could do. And if it is about accepting our identity, accepting who we are, it's about time we knew who we were. This is kind of a reflection of Mark's talk last week, so I'm so glad that Mark did the setup for me <laughs> because a lot of this stuff is just a reminder of what we covered last week. On the screen here are some truths about our identity, that we are justified, that we are loved, that we are redeemed, that we are his workmanship, that we are his, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. And I just wanted to share quickly that with my personal journey, as I said, some of this stuff is coming out of a personal journey that I'm on at the moment. There is something about knowing the freedom that I am loved by him. There's something that came from that. Because what I tried to do was I saw wrong behavior in myself. I was doing, still doing sometimes, wrong behavior. 
And I could count my sin, I could count my wrongness, I could count my failures against myself. I could say because of those things, I am not worthy. I am not holy. But I know that because of the blood of Jesus, I am holy. Because of the blood of Jesus, I am free. I am whole. I am perfect in his sight. That is the truth for everyone here today. That we are all of the things that he calls us to be. It's a very upside down, weird way of thinking about things. He calls us to be holy, but actually he's made it possible for us to be holy. So I want you to hold that in your head. Holiness is not about achieving a perfect scorecard. It can never be. It has to be about our identity, accepting who we are as children, as sons and daughters of God. And this kind of leads me on to another thing that I want to talk about briefly, which is there are some untrue assumptions that I think exist at the moment about holiness. And I've kind of alluded to this one already. There is something about this idea that we can do something to make ourselves perfect, that we can do something to make ourselves holy. I don't know where it started in Christendom, but it seems to permeate a lot of denominations, countries, wherever you go, there is this sense of, I can do X, Y, Z, and then I'll be good. Then I'll be holy. Then I'll be right. And that is what the Pharisees, back in the day when Jesus was around, were doing. God gave them a list of commands about how to pursue holiness. And you know what they did? They made more laws and more rules around those rules. They made guidelines of how to be holy because they thought that they could achieve it in their own strength. They thought that by doing X, Y, Z, they could be holy. And we could say, we, we don't think like that nowadays. When we read the stories in the Bible of Jesus coming against the Pharisees, we're on the side of Jesus. We go, how could, how could Pharisees believe like that and think like that? But we do it. We do it all the time. We think that somehow our acts, our deeds will make us right. And that's not the case. So my encouragement is don't be, an untru- don't be a modern Pharisee. That's an untrue assumption, number one. So therefore, that can lead other people to think, cool, I can do what I want. I've got a free pass to do whatever I want. Because I'm free, because I'm whole, because I'm redeemed, I've got a license to do whatever I want. Great. But no, Romans 6 says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means... How can we who die to sin live in it any longer? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. That's pretty cut and dry, really, isn't it? Let me tell you a story. So... Joe, my sister, um, who's five years older than me, had a car long before I did. Uh, when I passed my test, I couldn't afford a car. It was a bit, uh, too much to get. Insurance was like £2,000 or something stupid like that, and I was like, I couldn't afford that. Joe, who is a very loving sister, let me use the car whenever I want, probably more than I should have been able to use it. I was allowed to use her car. And one day, it was a rainy day. Um, We were were both living with my parents at the time. It was a really rainy day. We have a driveway with um, narrow walls on either side, a narrow gate, so walls on either side. As I was pulling out of the car, I was pulling the car out of the driveway, I didn't know that the wheel was turned. It was carried on going forward, and I went straight into the garden wall. Um, It was not a pretty sight. I felt horrible. I started panicking. I was like, what's Joe going to do? What's Joe going to do? What's Joe going to think of me? Because, you know, I live in fear of my sister Jo. Anyone who's met her knows she's a terrifying person. Um, But it's... I was just so scared. And then she was so lovely. (laughs) She was so good about it. She was just like, mistakes happen. I make mistakes. I'm sure this won't be the last mistake you make. Don't worry about it. That was such a loving, kind response to something that cost a few hundred quid to fix. So, that story, if I then, the next week, deliberately ploughed her car into a wall, (laughs) because I know that she's going to love me through it, because she's going to have a great response, that doesn't sound right, does it? (laughs) That doesn't sound like a, a love for my sister. And in the same way, we are free He has made us free. He has made us whole. 
Therefore, do I go on sinning? No, I'm dead to sin. I'm dead to those wrong ways because I love him, because he's sanctified me, because he's redeemed me, because it cost him everything to make me right. Why would I continue living in sin any longer? So that's another wrong assumption that we could have, that we can do what we want. With all of those things in mind, I wanted to frame all of that stuff because I could have jumped straight into how should we pursue holiness? Here's a guide of how we do the holy thing, how we live a holy life. But I want, to un- I want us to understand that there's a foundation here that we have to recognize that we are holy not because of anything that we have done, but by everything that he has done. And that this untrue assumption that there's nothing in our own strength that we can do. And at the same time, it doesn't mean that I can do whatever I want. I want us to understand those things before we go into some practicals. And I do want to talk about practicals. How do we pursue holiness? The first thing is spirit show me. Psalm 139 is a beautiful, beautiful psalm um, about asking the spirit to search us. So I'll just read a little bit of it. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. In this command, in this invitation to be holy, we can start doing a fault-finding mission. We can start looking internally and going, right, what are the wrong things that I've done? Let's now root them all out. Uh, I looked at someone wrong the other day. I looked at someone in lust the other day. I uh, swore the other day. Like, you could start doing this really unhelpful exercise of analyzing your life and then trying to find fault. I don't think that's the way that we should do things. I think there's something about asking the Spirit, Spirit, show me. Hold my hands up and say, God, search my heart. Know me. See if there's any wicked way within me. That's the way it starts. Um, And I would like to also say, I think this is in one of the talks that Jamie did about identity. If the Spirit does highlight something to you, please, please recognize that there is a joy in conviction. There is a joy in knowing of something being highlighted. There is, shouldn't be, shame. There's a joy in conviction because what a joy in conviction means is that the Spirit is showing you something of your untrue identity and trying to untwist it to get you back to your true identity. There's a joy in that process. There's a happiness in that process. And as Mark said last week, the counterfeit to conviction is accusation. And that is where the enemy comes in, and that is the thief of all joy. There's this thing of saying, oh, I did wrong. I got it wrong. I got it upset. I got, I'm upset. I got it wrong. Um, I did the bad thing. I am totally guilty of doing that sometimes. Realizing my own sin, realizing my own wrongness, and wallowing in how bad I am. But there is a joy in conviction, because actually it will lead us to our true identity and who he has made us to be. The next thing is confession and accountability. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How do we pursue holiness? I got it wrong. God, I got it wrong. I messed up. But I ask for your forgiveness. It's as simple as that. And then also, we need accountability. I need you and you need me to help us pursue holiness, to see the wrong things that are in our lives. A good friend is someone that will say, should you have spoken that way to that person? Should you have dealt with that situation that way? It's a faithful friend that can help you pursue holiness. And, sometimes, and we do need each other. So there's confession to God. And there's accountability to each other. Renewing our minds. Uh, Romans 12.2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing and you may discern what is the will of God what is good and acceptable and perfect. There is something about checking what we give our mind to, the books that we read, the things that we watch, uh, the people that we hang around with, the conversations that we have. Now, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't watch Netflix. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't read that romantic novel. Uh, It doesn't mean any of that. It just means that we should be discerning. Is what I'm intaking leading me to my true identity about who God says I am? Or is it leading me to a false identity? That's it. There's no blanket rule. I know some brothers that have said that they're not going to drink anymore. But some brothers have said that they're going to continue drinking um, socially. Um, That doesn't mean that one is right and one is wrong. They've had a personal revelation about, does this app lead me to my true identity or not? That's as simple as that. 
So that's how we can be renewing our minds. And obviously, the word is a great source of how to renew your mind as well. And then finally, how do we pursue holiness? It's just accepting something. It's accepting that this journey is countercultural. This world totally talks about do whatever you want. Be the person that you want to be. Whatever you decide is right is right. That is, so the pursuit of holiness goes against that. It says, no, I am not the arbiter. I am not the measuring stick by what is right or wrong. It's what God says. And I will pursue that instead. And it's counterintuitive, counterintuitive as I said, for all of this talk. One could lead, um, come away from this talk saying, okay, I'm going to do better. I'm going to try harder. But the counterintuitive thing is, it's actually when we accept that we can do nothing, that we walk in holiness. That actually, the acts that we do, the things that we do, are in recognition of, I am holy. They're not so to be holy, they are because I am holy. I will walk the right way, I will do the right thing, I will say the right things, I will think the right way. That is the way that we pursue holiness. So, right back to the beginning. There was the invitation in the story that I asked you to remember. The invitation, be holy as I am holy. That could seem like a very tall order. As I've been talking, there could be a list of things that already the Spirit's going, hey, how about this? What about this? What about that? That could feel overwhelming. That could feel too big a task to do by yourself. But then we remember the story. And it wasn't just Isaiah's story, it is our story as well. That by the blood of Jesus, we are holy. We are made right and pure. We are not consumed by our sin and our failures, but are transformed by his holiness. Like that coal that touched Isaiah and made him holy. That is what the blood of Jesus has done for us today. We are holy, not through anything that we have done. So then for we are empowered and enabled to do what he asks of us, to be holy as he is holy. Amen. I want to basically invite Jack and uh, Jamie to come up. I just want to spend like five minutes or so thinking about some responses. You may have heard a lot today. And these are some responses that I suggest. You may hear some other responses, but these are the ones that I think of. I want to repent of an untrue assumption I have about holiness. Either I'll be better one day, or what's the point? We may have held one or two or both of those things um, in our minds. Number two, I want to accept the invitation to be holy as he is holy. There is a free invitation that he's giving to every one of us who believe here today to be holy as he is holy. And first, last of all, spirit, search me. Show me how I can pursue holiness in my own life. I'm just going to ask Jack to sing this song, which is Boldly I Approach. And it's a song that I think is important because it captures what I've been trying to communicate today, that we can't pursue any of this through our own strength, through our own might. It's through a recognition that our holiness was bought with a precious price, but our holiness is freely available to us. And because of that, we can boldly approach the throne of God. So lonesome, how I stand when even angels fear to tread. Invited by redeeming love before the throne of God above, He pulls me close. With nail-scarred hands Into his everlasting arms When condemnation grips my heart And Satan tempts me to despair I hear the voice that scatters fear The great I am, the Lord is here Oh, praise the one who 
sacrifice for me and shields my soul eternally. And boldly I approach your throne. Blameless now I'm running home. By your blood I come, welcomed as you own into the arms of majesty. Boldly I approach your throne Blameless now I'm running home By your blood I come Welcomed as your own Into the arms of majesty And this is the arm for listening to this podcast by Lifeline Church. We hope this message has been an encouragement to you. We are a relational church with a passion to demonstrate God's love to one another and our surrounding community in real and practical ways. We believe that God has called us to have an impact on our families, our communities and our nation. We'd love to connect further with you, so please do visit our website at lifelinechurch.co.uk on Facebook, lifeline.church.uk or Twitter at Lifeline UK.